All right, everyone, I want to thank you again for joining us this evening um, for our author talk with Waiki Wang, author of the newly published Joan is OK. Uh, my name is Emily Anderson, and I am the Assistant Adult Programming and Outreach Coordinator here for the Dauphin County Library System. Um, we would like to thank the Central Pennsylvania Chinese Association for partnering with us on this program. Um, the CPCA is a nonprofit whose goals include promoting mutual friendship, public welfare, and community identity in the South Central Pennsylvania and greater Harrisburg region through cultural and social activities. Um, and again, this evening, uh, we are honored to welcome Waiki Wang. Um, Waiki is a graduate of Harvard University, where she earned her undergraduate degree in chemistry and her doctorate in public health. She received her master's of fine arts from Boston University. Since the publication of her debut novel, Chemistry, in 2017, Waiki Wang has garnered much well-deserved critical acclaim. The aforementioned Chemistry earned her a spot on the National Book Foundation's annual 5 under 35 list, where she was lauded as a brilliant new literary voice that astutely juxtaposes the elegance of science, the anxieties of finding a place in the world, and the sacrifices made for love and family. Waiki's work has also earned her the 2018 Penn and Hemingway Award for debut novel and the 2018 Whitting Award for fiction. Her work has appeared in Glimmer Train and The New Yorker, and her, story, her short story work has earned her a spot in both the 2019 O. Henry Prize anthology, as well as the Best American Short Stories for 2019. Uh, tonight, Waiki is here to discuss with us her most recent novel, Joan is OK. Uh, without further ado, Waiki, if you're ready to read. Sure, yeah, of course. Um, so thank you guys for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about my second book, Joan is OK. Um, and it has a really nice cover. We can talk about the cover. Um, and the title is also fun. Um, I'm going to start from the, not really from the beginning, beginning, but um, a little bit from sort of the, the, the page 14. So the real context that you need to know is by this point, um, and I'm not giving you any spoilers, but because by the second page, her father has passed um, from sort of, you know, you know, sudden accident, and she's gone to China for a weekend for the funeral, and now she is back at work. Um, so she went there for like 48 hours, which now at this point is impossible uh, because of quarantine. But when I was writing this book, I hadn't, you know, none of that had really happened. Um, so this is a little bit at the beginning on page 14. A common confusion is between intensive and emergency care. The latter is chaotic, usually on the first floor near the ambulance drop-off, in a room without dividers or enough beds. Someone might scream, doctor, and because no one answers, that person screams on. Intensive care is just the opposite. It's the best care that a hospital can give. And the room is quiet, except for machine sounds, alarms that go on and off. Just as radiologists know their imaging, ICU doctors know machines, ones that push oxygen into you, the almighty vent, ones that clean your blood, dialysis, the pumps, AKA drips, that deliver medication and sedation through a central line directly to the heart. With many machines come many tubes, the endotracheal tube down the throat and to the vent for air, the nasal gastric tube to the stomach for food, rectal tubes for stool, a Foley for the bladder, etc. Fluid control was imperative. Too much fluid in and the body would swell. Too much fluid out and it would desiccate. At my interview three years ago, the director asked why I chose intensive care. And I said, I like the purity of it, the total sense of control. Machines can tell you things that the people attached to them can't, I said. I like that the sick didn't stay with us long, but for the stunt that they do, we give it our all. A sprinter, I describe myself. The idea of longitudinal care wasn't for me. My director praised my honesty and offered me the attending position right then. More so than any authority figure I'd met before, he seemed to believe in me and agreed with my point about machines. From then on, I knew that we were a match. In any specialty, an attending is expected to lead and guide her interns and residents along in their careers. To become an attending, I had trained for 12 years. The job was to teach machine readings. And a question I like to ask was, how is this patient interacting with her machine? What's the dance there like? 
If a patient fought, machine and patient became desynchronous. If they danced, the two were synchronous. Usually the patient fought. Our innate drives to breathe and to dance alone are strong. I taught on average three to five hours a day. The other hours were spent supervising. Procedures that I did in half the time pre-attending, I watched someone else do in double. If learning required mistakes, then teaching required watching different people make the same mistakes. Teaching was relentless deja vu, but grounding. It cemented the idea that we are all the same, height and weight did not matter, and the possibility of failure or success for anyone was never too far off. To streamline the instruction process, I had a habit of printing double-sided handouts. And during morning rounds, the sound that I waited for and enjoyed most was that of my eight-person team, the pharmacists included, turning their pages in unison and on cue. The sound reminded me of the wind, which reminded me of being outside, which I currently was not. At my first year review, the director asked if I liked my new role here. I said I did. Did I respect my team? I said I respected them on more days than not. He commended my honesty again. Anything else he could help me with? Anything at all? As part of my hiring package, I'd been given my own private office, but I didn't like how it echoed or how far I had to walk from unit to office, cafeteria to office, office to another office, wasting time. A smaller, more centrally located space comes with people, the director warned, as in you would have to share it with your colleagues. And is that what you want? I said I would like to try. Soon I was relocated to a shared office with other attendings. The hospital had hundreds of doctors, but only 10 or so for three ICUs. To my left and right sat Madeline and Reese. Before I moved in, they had heard things about me, all true. The private office went to an older cardiologist who also wrote philosophical books about death. I tried to read one, but put it down. The books were too thick, with indexes alone of 100 pages. Death was inevitable. I didn't know what else there was to say. How was China? Reese asked Monday morning when I had returned. He was heading up to the surgical ICU as I was going into cardiac. We passed each other in the corridor meant for equipment. I relayed my cousin's message that the country has changed. Buildings were taller and fatter, as well as the people. Obesity would soon be a problem since food was ubiquitous, along with very high-tech phones. Everyone had a phone, and everyone paid with their phones. The economy was cashless. But how's your family, I mean? I asked why he wanted to know that. You never talk about them, he said. And then this terrible thing happens. I keep wondering if you and your father were strange. Was there a small, teensy, generational cultural gap? To illustrate how teensy, Reese brought his pointer finger a centimeter away from his thumb. I said my father was entirely supportive of my path. And who wouldn't be, said Reese, standing with both hands on his waist above his belt in a pose that he called his power stance. Great paths, both of us. Not many people can do what we do. But put another way, what's your fondest memory of him, your father? I started to say something, but then forgot the memory and the rest of my thoughts. No wonder, Reese said. No wonder what? He didn't tell me and then quickly changed topics. How long have you been single, he asked, all of my life. No boyfriends ever? I shook my head. Fascinating. No crushes in school. No one night stands in college. I said I was busy. But you weren't studying all the time. In fact, I was. I asked if he thought my singleness could have something to do with my personality. Your personality is fine. Maybe my looks? You're a vision. I laughed because I knew the kind of woman Reese liked. They usually had lashes. He was the vision and handsome enough to have his picture grace three of our hospital brochures for critical care. It has happened before a family member comes in from the waiting room and flaps one of our blue leaflets around. Is this doctor in, they ask, pointing to the picture because they want only the best, only this stately face of medicine for their unconscious and sedated loved one. Don't take this the wrong way, Reese added, but you're a catch and you shouldn't have to look that hard. Any guy would be lucky. 
not me, unfortunately. We know each other too well, and I'm madly in love with Madeline. But let me know how I can help. Here was our motto, as it was in any ICU. Are you suffering from ARDS, sir, madam? Because if so, we can help. What is ARDS? Yes, sir, madam, we understand too many acronyms, not enough time. ARDS is acute respiratory distress syndrome or severe inflammation of your lungs. Each ICU had personality. The cardiac ICU had its cardiologist, lots of men coming in to talk about electrophysiology and tiny gadgets to put in the heart. The surgical, surgical ICU had its surgeons and anesthesiologists, doctors who wrote the shortest and most indecipherable notes. The notes reminded me of haikus, and because I wasn't a literary person, I called my time in this unit difficult poetry. My me the medical ICU is my favorite. With no specialties and subspecialties, it was just me and my team, meaning I had full autonomy. I had the floor. The medical ICU saw any number of cases, and the lack of knowing what was ahead to be in control but completely in the dark was my jam. This unit was also home to ECMO, or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, or my all-time favorite machine. Four feet tall, 83 pounds, with tubing that could extend out farther from its body and into a person. ECMO lived only at hospitals and was worth the same amount as a luxury sedan. To keep someone alive, the machine bypassed the person's lungs and heart. Blood was pulled out of the person via tube and funneled into ECMO to be cleaned, oxygenated, and returned. A person on ECMO could be sedated or awake. A person could walk with her ECMO as if it were a friend to lean on, but also drag along. Two weeks on ECMO was average. Anything longer, a month or months, was very bad news. How could human engineers have created ECMO, I wondered. This boxy machine on a cart rarely needed maintenance, while in every public bathroom everywhere, half the automatic faucets didn't run, and the only paper towel dispenser didn't dispense. When I saw Madeline later, she was giving me notes for my rotation into medical, and I was telling her that no coincidence to me, ECMO sounded like Elmo, that lovable red Muppet with a giant flapping mouth. I saw myself as its friend, as friend of ECMO, tickle me ECMO. You need to stop anthropomorphizing, said Madeline. It's true that I have thought of putting googly eyes on ECMO or drawing on a face. As I was telling Madeline about googly eyes, how a set of them can make anything funny, even a blood pumping machine, I was also eating a bagel with strawberry cream cheese. Suddenly she leaned over into me and I thought she had fallen or fainted, but she was trying to give me a hug. Because I wasn't near a table, it was either drop the bagel or not return the hug. I dropped the bagel, napkin, and the entire paper plate as Madeline had never been this welcoming before. If you ever need to talk, she said, made hug. At work, Madeline was a true badass, using only her fingers to teach, no handouts, and she could run a code with impeccable form. To run a code was to run the death algorithm, a series of chest compressions and adrenaline shots that had a one in four chance of bringing a person back. To call a code was to stop the death algorithm and to announce three out of four times that the person had died. Once the hug was over, I picked up the bagel and cleaned the pink smear off the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, I wonder if you would be willing to tell us why, why that passage? What made you decide that that was the, the passage you wanted to share with us this evening? Well, you know, with reading, sometimes the easiest thing is to start at the beginning. And then at the beginning, the, we have this death, we have this trip. And I felt like maybe an audience member would actually want to know what what um what Joan does like what that work life is like um and you know every time I said to my editor oh I'm gonna write this female doctor I think there is this image of what physicians are like right like maybe they're a little bit humorless they're very serious they work really hard they're kind of stoic um and you know they're very good at their jobs um and so I kind of wanted to give a sense of what an ICU doctor is like but this specific ICU doctor who sort of is obviously good at her job, knows things, um, will show up, has colleagues, but will also sort of have a favorite machine, which, you know, is, is something that maybe we don't think about doctors having as favorite machines or, um, or, or thinking about, you know, um, 
doctors being on faces on brochures and thinking of it as a business in a way um, because the it is a business this is it a work it is a work life and I thought that might be a good way to open and just see what kind of character Jonah is because um, I never want you know the headline oh she's an ICU doctor to turn someone off from reading it um, because you know some people might think oh it's so scientific I can't I won't be able to get into that um, or I won't be able to understand any of the lingo and hopefully from that reading you can tell that you know um, she has a very kind of specific way of interacting with people, but it really is written for everyone to understand and sort of to enjoy. Um, it's not Grey's Anatomy. Um, <laughs> you know, if anything, it's probably closer to Scrubs um, and kind of having that balance of humor with with some of the seriousness of what being a doctor and being in medicine is like. Yeah. And Joan is very funny. I will say I, I, there were a number of, of instances in this book where she's talking about um, you know, her co-workers or her family members right. or just people uh, people in general that that really made me take pause and chuckle um i i don't know i think it's interesting too that you talk about her having this favorite machine and and having uh, and liking something that has such a specific place in the hospital and is is for such a specific job because um joan to me i don't know she she goes through a lot in this novel of other people examining her and and wondering like if she's yeah. if she's doing all right as the title would indicate is is Joan okay right and and Joan feels very comfortable within her very specific place at the hospital um, right. so much so that she doesn't want to leave it that's a, that's another oh. main point of conflict within the book is you know her people in her life telling her you need to rest you need to take some time off and she feels uncomfortable taking that rest she wants that specific place um she yes. wants to have her ECMO moment right, right. like she wants right. to be a part of the functioning of the hospital right. um, and always there right just like mm -hmm. just like ECMO this machine is never going to leave this hospital this like luxury sedan um she she also just wants to stay there forever um and I think part of this is it, you know it's obviously the workload of medicine is very notorious but I think it maybe taps into anyone who's kind of a workaholic and sort of loves being at the place of work. Um, and I think what the pandemic did, for, well, for me, at least as a writer, I just work from home, so it's not a huge deal. But for a lot of people where they had this like workplace that they just went to for work, right? And that was sort of where they felt useful and where they felt needed. Um, that sort of got destroyed for them during the pandemic. And I think this idea of place of work um, is something that, you know, we think a little bit more now since so many things are hybrid and home and, you know, there's just no like divider anymore. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, did you say something? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, there was, there's a little section, a small section I wanted to read on, um, Page 92, it, she says, at face value, medicine was still a meritocracy and the most straight straightforward path that I could take. Moving through the ranks had less to do with what I looked like or my family, but had everything to do with the amount of effort I could put in. No culture yeah. except the work culture and showing up as much as possible for as long as possible to do your job, which was not always easy, but it was simple. Bring that person back from death store and gold star. Um, yeah. I thought that that was a, a really you know, kind of, summative moment in the text and kind of just talking about how how Joan is feeling as she's grappling with the sudden loss of her father and all of a sudden her co-workers and her neighbors and her family members decide to start questioning like is she all right what is her place in the world whereas she has found her place in in, in her eyes she feels very comfortable where she is um right. so I guess I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about um kind of that disparity between you know Mm -hmm. Sorry, let me try to find a way to ask this question. How how, how would you classify, um, you know, Joan's kind of reckoning with these two sorts of, you know, her internal place and yeah. how people are questioning her, her life and her, who well, she is? She has, this, she just has a singular focus. And I think, um, you know, obviously in many ways, um, the best characters in literature have sort of an exaggerated trait to them, I think. You know, like Madame Bovary or something like that. And Joan, I mean, I just really wanted to kind of exaggerate that singular mindedness of 
working and sort of being very utilitarian, just like that section you read um, about sort of following this path and going from A to B to C and sort of just having that straightforward plan and not really questioning it. I think the common trajectory is, oh, I went on this long path and now I question it. I need to figure out who I am. I need to go and you know discover myself. And she's just she's just like no I think I'm okay I think I'm fine um and so it's kind of this like unconventional sense of um I'm really comfortable with who I am I'm kind of unapologetic for it. maybe you don't like me that's okay you know you don't need to like me but the strange thing is because of her father's death that kind of catalyzes things for her like her colleagues are trying to be more sympathetic um when she's not asking for that but they're trying to be the director thinks that he needs to help her but she almost doesn't understand why he's helping her um his her neighbor is trying to sort of be a little bit more welcoming because he thinks that well he thinks that joan like doesn't have a life so i that, that's what he thinks um and sort of you know his her sibling her um brother and her sister-in-law are kind of saying well now dad's gone you know we're a little bit worried about you because well first of all dad dad how, is never going to meet your kids, right? Are you going to have kids? Um, what about your future husband? Shouldn't we try to stabilize you a little bit? In the same way that Joan stabilizes everyone else at the hospital, like patient, mm -hmm. people who are sick, you know, everyone is like, oh, we need her in stable condition. Um, everyone else is sort of treating Joan like the patient, right? Um, because they think she's, there's no way that no doctor can diagnose themselves, right? So the sense that, well, we need to help you. We need to diagnose a problem. And you know, the, the, the part you read from was also, she was reminiscing about the many counselors that she's had, right? Yes. Where yeah. everyone was trying to kind of pinpoint a problem. And I oftentimes think that, you know, um, the, the, the defining features of normality, right, is the do any dominant culture will define what's normal, right? Um, and so she sort of is not reflecting that, um, not just by how she looks and whatnot, you know, being a minority in a male dominated field, but just how she acts, how she interacts with people. It's not quote unquote normal. Um, and I think what I wanted to create for her is that she was just, I mean, she was gonna sit through all these counselor meetings, but she wasn't gonna change. Um, and she was kind of just gonna move forward. Um, and I think in Joan's mind, she's thinking, I'm not really hurting anyone. I don't know why everyone is clamoring to change me. What what about just like live and let live, you know, just let me live my life and I will let you live your life as I, as I've always had. Yeah, she's not hurting anyone. In fact, she's being praised at work. She's right, being given, right. you know, a pay raise. She's been put in mm -hmm. charge of, you know, she's she's an attending. She's a well-respected attending. Um, right. She, to, to the point where, and I thought this was, you know, kind of an interesting, there's another part um, where she's talking to her mother later in, in the yes. book about doing, um, helping her, her helping her nephews with with their homework when really she just yes. you know does the work for them it kind of harkens <laughs> back to her spot in the hospital where she takes on so much work that it makes her co-workers sort of feel as though he's less than to some extent and I right. thought that, that was an interesting sort of discussion when her mother says um if you don't allow other people to learn struggle they'll never grow or something to that extent um and and I thought that that was really interesting because you know Joan is uh, she's not a yes man per se, but she's very motivated, right? She's very willing to do whatever it is that needs to be done because that's, you know, her job, her purpose. That is the role for herself. She feels very comfortable doing those things. And when, you know, when other people call that into question is the only time when she starts to feel, um, not that she feels unsure, but she, she starts to question and, and think of those things. Um, right. And I really appreciated the way, um, just the, the, the way that, you know, intersectionality comes into play in this text, right? Her being, as you said, a, an Asian American minority um, right. and her being a, a female doctor. Um, just, I don't know, all of, all of these different pressures and expectations that, that people have for Joan. Why doesn't she have kids? Why isn't she married? Um, so, I don't know, I, I thought that it was handled very well. Um, and Sorry, I I, there's so much. There's so much I want to talk to you about with this book because I, I really thought that um, I don't know. I, I really appreciated a character yeah. who felt so, you know, comfortable in in who she is, who was willing to stand up to the people in her life about about yeah. that. Um, right. 
I think it's hard. I mean, some of these, you know, I, when I created the world around, like the scaffolding around this character, right, there's her work friends, there's her neighbors. Um, and I think the the neighbor I pulled really from just all the shows where there is like the New York neighbors, you know, cliche is so like friends or Seinfeld, right? Like it seems, you know, the trope of the New York neighbor. I really wanted to lean into that. Um, and he also watches all of those shows. Um, and then kind of her family life, right? So I kind of had this threefold scaffolding. Um, and it was it was fun to work with it. You know, this book taught me a lot about plot. It taught me a lot about balance. It taught me how to kind of juggle characters and move between scenes. Um, and, you know, like you said, I, I, I knew from the beginning that I didn't think Joan was really going to change, right? She was, you know, when we, when we write, the, the teacher's always like, the protagonist has to change or has to have mm -hmm. a potential for change. And I thought, what, what about not, not having that and sort of having this um, kind of existential crisis be very external to her? Like everyone is having an existential crisis on her behalf and she is yeah. not, you know? Um, and what really inspired this character in some ways? You know, I knew I was always going to write an Asian American doctor. I just felt I wanted to see that person on the page. Um, I wanted that kind of representation. If I think about all the times that Asian doctors are represented, it, it, there's sort of this like, you know, narrowing of this character. Um, but what really kind of inspired this book is that I've read, you know, Camus' The Stranger in high school, which mm -hmm. during that time I had no idea what was happening in that book. Um, and then in college, I read it again. And then I think, you know, three years ago, I read it again. And then I, there's something about that book, about how it starts with sort of this detached narrator and something totally extreme happens, right? Obviously, there's no murder in this book. It's not like a, a Kafka-esque trial. But in some ways, that was sort of an inspiration of thinking about, well, what happens when a death has the, this like dominoes effect that everyone starts to question your identity and everyone starts to question, well, is she grieving enough for her father? Um, is she too robotic? Is she, um, does she have feelings? Is she a person? Um, and, you know, by the end in The Stranger, right, that character's on trial for, right, the, the murder of this, you know, person, but really the, not grieving her, his, her, not grieving his mother. So in some ways, I felt the grief of the father could kind of parallel that. Like, what are these people really mad about? I think in mm -hmm. some ways, they're angry that she's not grieving in the same way that other people would. That makes them nervous, right? Um, that makes them nervous that they're maybe sitting next to a weirdo at work or like in the building, right? Um, and no one wants that. So in some ways that was sort of the inspiration and the scaffolding that went through. But Joan has just such a singular voice that I couldn't really change it when I wrote it. I mean, she just has a certain way of thinking about things. Um, and sort of like this, this it, it is narrow, but it's also kind of gets broader as she becomes a little bit more self-aware later on. Well, I think it's very specific to her experience, right? Because okay. she, she does talk a lot about having to not necessarily come up by herself, but, you know, it's the experience of uh, the child of, of immigrants, right? Like having oh, to okay. translate tax documents, having to talk to people on the phone, having yeah. to kind of grow up a lot quicker in ways that you might not expect a child to have to do. Um, yeah. And then she talks about having, um, you know, her family goes back to, her parents go back to China after, as soon as she, is, is it when yeah. she gets into college or when she graduates? Yeah, when she college? gets into college or yeah. So like see you later um drop off and then we're gonna we're gonna go back to china right. um and, and in some ways you know the reason i i wrote that is not only do i have friends and peers in which that has happened to it it, it sort of felt in some ways like um a, a sense of like the ultimate sacrifice i'm giving this mm. country for kids and i'm gonna go back and you know go go you in this place go figure it out right be a good citizen be a good person um, you know, contribute to society, um, sure. and we will see you later. <laughs> um, so in some ways, it's like the ultimate parental sacrifice of kind of giving over these kids to sort of like the workforce of America. Um, and that's something I wanted to kind of think about because Joan is the workforce, you know, like 25% of health professionals are Asian. Mm -hmm. They represent a huge portion of the people who are on the front lines for the pandemic and for just all things, but it's also a service industry. So I think it's one of these things where Joan is thinking, am I 
like the same thing as a car mechanic or am I kind of this procedures role, right? Am I, the, the, am I help, you know, I have to help anyone who comes to help me, right? I, that's a service industry, but doctors are always exalted as, you know, like think about house of God, which I was not going to write, but, but those are kind of the medical books that I had read before. Um, you know, doctors somewhere in between, I think God and car mechanic. <laughs> mm. Um, and so she's trying to find that place really for herself. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to me too, how, you know, her parents' philosophy kind of clashes, not even kind of, it, it, it clashes to a certain extent with, you know, this American right. philosophy and this idea right. of, you know, at one point she's, she's getting very frustrated with her neighbor, yeah. Mark, who, who yeah. very like crosses her boundaries, um, in a, in a way right. that's, <laughs> I re- <laughs> I read that there's that scene in the book where where Mark just lets himself in. Yeah, um, it's yeah. It made me laugh. Um, well, that's what that Kramer does. In, like every single Seinfeld episode, Kramer yeah. just like like slides in, and you're like, Jesus, how is this possible? Um, well, this but- distinction between you know, kind of the the idea of the American individual as yeah. opposed to the idea of participating in society like being being a part of something larger as opposed to um you know kind of just standing out on your own and and being congratulated just for existing sort of sort of thing right um yeah I mean I think in some ways with Mark you know I had this kind of trope in mind and he's meant to be a little bit of a character that's true um but but in some ways, like you said, it's this idea of kind of thinking about American individualism, which is a great thing. It's, you know, it, it you know, being special is a good feeling. No, everyone mm. likes being special, but also like thinking about the common collective good, which is sometimes what Fong, her brother, is thinking about, because he's like, he's thinking, if you never marry and you never have kids, our kids don't have cousins right. and they don't have aunts and uncles. And isn't that kind of odd that they don't grow up with aunt and uncles because that's sort of part of the normal American family. So don't you think you should take one for the team and maybe have a child or something like that so that we can kind of complete this picture? Um, so he's thinking a like long term, right? Like he's thinking the plan. He wants everyone to kind of stabilize because their parents had sort of a tumultuous immigrant experience. And, you know, like their parents is like generation zero, right? Obviously, they're mm-hmm. not going to have a good time. But Fung is thinking, well, our kids are going to have a better time. So let's ensure that, right? Let's kind of make sure, let's set it up well. Um, let's give them a safety net. And Joan is just completely like, you know, yeah, that's what you think, but I don't really want to do that. So she has that dose of sort of American kind of stubbornness and just being this individual, um, even though it's very counter to kind of common sense, even though, you know, having kids and being a family is also part of American life, right? Um, but with Mark, Mark is just one of these people who, um he's a character but he also right likes to explain things to Joan like I he's the one that tries to explain I think racism at the hospital yeah. <laughs> or like discrimination or like misogyny and Joan is thinking thank you that was helpful <laughs> it was completely unwarranted it's completely right, right. they're not talking about it at all it's, be- it's because it she all. she has been encouraged to take time off of work because her yeah. father has died and he's like oh it's because they're racist they're punishing yeah. you because they're, they're racist punishing the you and and joan's thinking really and you know it's one of these things where i was really just playing with the stereotype of woke culture kind of yeah. like people who like to explain things to you and then also getting it totally wrong, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, missing the mark, right? Um, no pun intended. <laughs> um, but but sort of, I, I just created that character because I just know that character. So I know yeah. that person so well of someone who's, you, you can't even say he's not well-meaning. He's really trying to help, but in like a very, in a way that Joan can't really understand how to process, right? Like, you know, is she going to do not take time off because of misogyny or like what, you know, she doesn't know what the solution is at this point um, with that kind of input. Yeah, it's a, it's <laughs> such a funny, I don't know, I thought, I thought I, was... I'm trying to make HR funny because HR is so hard to deal with, like hospital HR bureaucracy, as you know, I mean, it, you do sort of feel, you know, I was a clinical researcher for like two years and sort of the amount of time I just thought about paperwork and just like how inefficient paperwork was and like how I was going to many different floors to do the same thing. Yeah. And then I had different paperwork. And I don't know, I just, I just, you know, I was sort of reflecting on the comedy of that um, and sort of how 
bureaucratic a hospital can be. Um, it is a life-saving place, of course, but it's also a business um, and it's run like that as well in terms of sort of solidifying our <laughs> brochures and solidifying accounts payable and sort of mm -hmm. making sure that everyone has mental wellness or whatnot. Yeah, I, I actually, now that you mentioned that, I did want to talk to you a little bit about your background in, in mm -hmm. you know, medicine and public health, yeah. and kind of the transition from your, your areas of a scholastic study yeah. into yeah. You know, writing about them and, and kind of right. that sort of journey and how right. that began. Yeah, I mean, writing was really kind of an accident in terms of I, um, uh, my undergrad at Harvard was in chemistry. Um, I think if I'd done chemistry elsewhere, I probably would have been a happy chemist by now, but Harvard really sucks the soul out of a lot of fun things. Um, so, you know, that taught me I maybe didn't want to become like a, like a serious, serious chemist. Um, and, and then after that, I was in clinical research for a few years because I was thinking, oh, I, you know, I'd probably pre-med. Um, and sometimes I think pre-med, pre-law, it's just like a track that, you know, now that I teach undergrads, it's like, I need, I don't know what to do. So I'm, I'm pre-med, you know, I don't know yeah, what to do in terms sure. of pre-law. There's so many other occupations out there and there's so many ways to make a living other than these like very, very solid tracks. Um, so I was pre-med. Um, I worked in the cardiology floor of a hospital, really turned me off of cardiology. I don't know, sometimes maybe it's me, like maybe it's like how I interact with the world, <laughs> but worked with a lot of cardiologists and realized maybe, maybe that wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, and, you know, realized that I kind of liked um, research. I really did like thinking about problems and solving problems um, and kind of thinking about, you know, large scale data, large scale problems. Um, and so I went into public health and epidemiology and, when I graduated epidemiology, I, I liked it, but I think I didn't like it enough to be like, I, I'm really dedicated to epidemics because I thought, when is, when are we going to have an epidemic? You know, <laughs> Surprise! Epidemic. Surprise, right? Um, and I thought how, you know, it's not, it's not going to be a thing. We're never going to have an infectious disease epidemic. Um, <laughs> and then during that time, I had done an MFA at BU. I was lucky enough. I had really generous teachers, really helpful peers who kind of got my thesis to chemistry, which was my first book. Um, and sort of this idea of, you know, preparation and luck kind of working out at the same time. Um, the book found a publisher and, you know, I was able to kind of continue working in writing and teaching. Um, and I ask, I ask myself this all the time about, you know, do I miss, I think I would have gone back into science if I really missed it. I do mm -hmm. do sort of like science teaching and science education work and stuff like that. But I think I don't miss sort of like being on, you know, um, being sort of at the forefront of like research in that way. Um, I do like being sort of on the forefront of thinking about literature. What can I do to the modern canon? What can I contribute to literature? What can I do for, you know, Asian American representation um, and, and things like that. Um, so I felt like I, I, you know, you only have a limited time in this, on this earth, right? So there's maybe places where you want to put a little bit more time, really kind of invest, you know, the time and energy into something. Um, and that was writing for me. And, um, after chemistry, I was really terrified that I would never write again. And then, you know, I had a year of, I don't know, crying and then I got over it. Um, and I wrote, wrote Joan, um, and went through a lot of edits with my editor, um, and, you know, kept writing stories. So sort of just like honing the craft and practicing, um, teaching, you know, I really loved it, um, in terms of sort of putting together this strange writer's lifestyle. Um, but, but it is sort of like ad hoc. It is sort of, you know, you, you, you find an opportunity and you jump on it, right. Or mm -hmm. you find an idea and you sort of investigate it in some ways research did prepare me really well for that because you're always in the dark you know like Joan said um you're in total control but you're in the dark right like as a writer you're in total control of your novel no one's ever going to tell you what to write or how to write it which is wonderful the autonomy is great but you have no idea what you're doing for like two years you know so so, so you're really just like kind of figuring it out and figuring out the pieces and this might work this might not work um, and that's what, sort of what makes it so aggravating, but it, it's kind of like a research program, you know, you're, you're just building it one brick at a time, one sentence at a time, really, for a book. Yeah. So about chemistry, I'm, I'm wondering if you would be willing to, to talk to us. I know it's, you, it's been out for a couple of years now, but I, I, oh, I have I a question. 
yeah, I, I was just wondering if you wanted to, to talk to us a little bit about that. And then I had a specific question because um, I know that in, in some of your other work and in chemistry, you've, you've got characters, main characters who go unnamed, right? right. And, and so Joan has, I mean, she, she has a name. She's on yep. the cover yeah. of the book, the title of the book. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering, and my thought is that probably because again, you had a very specific person in mind that you wanted to write about, right? Like a very, right. like, do you think that, that now you'll go back to writing nameless characters? Do you think that you'll continue to, to think of specific, I guess, like you just I said, kind I mean, of. I, yeah, no, I, I get I, this. This is a good question. I mean, I think with names comes sort of like identity issues um, and that's just inevitable. Um, and I think I need to think hard about if I want those, if I want to tap into those issues, I might just do the like, artsy thing of just putting the initials or putting you know a letter to represent the name I don't know um it I think it really depends on the piece for for Joan is okay the name in the end means something because you know she goes into like who named her why yeah, why this sure. her name. um and I wasn't going to just let a name like Joan go if I couldn't get into that um and I I think it's important I think it's important to think about Joan as this like I, you know, I love the name um it, it's sort of like, it's my best friend's middle name. I met three Jones in college who went on to become doctors, oddly enough. Um, I think maybe I should just send them these books. Um, but, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's sort of like a really strong name. I like the monosyllabic aspect of it. Um, I sort of like how it looks. I like J's. Um, and then it was an easy way to translate that name into, into Chinese. Um, and it's a nice name to kind of play with nicknames. Um, mm -hmm. As you probably could guess, my nickname, my name had a lot of nicknames growing up. I think, you know, everyone had a nickname for me. Um, and so in the book, you know, her mom calls her like Jonah because she like can't figure out that Joan is one syllable. And then her brother calls her by her Chinese name, like um, Joanne. And her sister-in-law calls her Joni because it's kind of like a little sister, big sister thing. So I think it's sort of a way that with the name, I really wanted to make it matter. And everybody in our family calls her by her by a different name, you know? Mm -hmm. And her dad just calls her Dr. Daughter. Like Dr. She, Daughter, <laughs> yeah. Her dad doesn't even call her by her first name. Um, so I think I wanted to play with that aspect of, you know, the nicknames that we generate around this character. And then no one really, her doorman calls her Joanne, you know? So it, it's this sense of like, kind of like a fractured identity in many ways that she has to sort of live with and kind of reconcile. Yeah, very cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, we have about 15 minutes left in our time together. Um, so I wanna open up the floor to, um, to our participants this evening, if you would like to um, unmute your microphone at this time, or if you would like to type a question in the chat, please feel free to do so. Um, if you need any help with doing that, uh, your microphone icon, if you hover over the screen with your cursor, should be in the lower left-hand quadrant of the screen. Um, we'll give everybody a couple of minutes to, to ask me. I have a whole page of notes here that I wanted to talk to you about things. I'm not sure if we, we got to some of them, but there's there's really so much to, to talk about with this book. I think there's a lot of layers. Um, I, I really appreciated sure, yeah. the family dynamics and, and this, this idea of familial expectations and, and living up to, um, or, or not necessarily living up to what what other people think should be, you know, the outcome for you, right? Right. Um, right. I really, well, I, mean, I really I enjoyed this. I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, um, so, you know, parental expectations, because she's a child of immigrants, it's, it's just unavoidable, right? When you're, when your parents sort of give up this much of their life to restarting, there's sort of this expectation of, what the parents want success and you know quantifiable levels of success but what i what i what i really did not want to do was paint the, the parents like villains you know they have had a tough life but there really is an expiration date for when you can blame your parents for your problems you know so i think um a lot of the identity issues that she has yeah sure her kind of tumultuous childhood 
might have contributed to that, right? Of course it did. And her having to, you know, help her parents with English and be sort of the spokesperson in the house along with her brother and sort of fill out forms by herself um, and sort of kind of like figure things out on herself, that probably bred a, lot, a little bit of resentment. But in the end, that's, that's just how that's just how the cards played out for her family, you know? Um, and she's not gonna change that. Complaining about it is not gonna change that. Blaming her parents is not gonna change that. Um, and so I think she's, you know, what I wanted to do with like these kind of Asian parents, and well, I'm very cognizant of the sense of, I never wanna vilify Asian parents ever because I never want it to seem like these kids are so ungrateful that, you know, the, the parents are there. Um, because I do feel that sometimes that's the narrative that Asian parents are so strict and they're so, you know, like emotionally and mentally abusive and et cetera, et cetera. But like, who's telling these stories? The kids are, <laughs> right? Um, because they have mastery of the language. Um, and the parents are never going to tell these stories because they're sort of like, you know, they have imperfect English. Um, but an imperfect English and imperfect does not mean they're imperfect people 100%, right? Or they're imperfect mentally. Um, and so I was very cognizant of, you know, the expectations are high. But I wanted the parents to sort of be endearing as well. And those are just the circumstances. That's just what happened. Um, and I don't think Joan actually feels, you know, any kind of hate or resentment towards them or bitterness. She's, she just, she just wants her mom to be comfortable. Um, and she wants her brother to be comfortable and likewise for, for them as well. Yeah, Joan's, Joan's mother was one of my favorite characters in this book as well. I thought that she was, um, but she was very funny. She was very, also very sure of herself um, and, and what she wanted. And, and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I really liked, I really liked her character. Um, yeah. We've got a couple of questions in sure. the chat. Um, the first one, it seems like a big jump from your technical early college experience to an MFA. Um, and someone wants to know what drove you to working on your MFA? Yeah. Um... Well, um, I think I was, you know, just at that time, I was sort of year four of my PhD and that year is sort of like really the, you know, the dark, dark black hole, the soul, uh, you, you're just a little confused, I'm starting, studying for my quals. And then I was, you know, you think, oh, why not just try something new? Why not just like blow up the house or something? Um, it's dumb, but that's what I was thinking at that time because I sort of had a dark moment of the soul. Um, and then, so I just applied to the BU MFA program, sort of like one of these things that you do after you drink like four glasses of wine. You're like, I'm going to do it. <laughs> and then lo and behold, I got in uh, um, and I thought, well, I can't, I can't give it up. It's free, right? It was like a free, I didn't have to pay tuition. Um, okay. Yeah. And I mean, they didn't pay me anything. So, you know, but I was like, oh, why not do it? And I definitely didn't want to go into debt for a writing degree, but I thought, you know, why not do it? And being kind of this like crazy workaholic that I am, I was like, like, just add it to the plate. Um, and it was really fun. I met so many, I have so many good friends from that program. I love the teachers. I wouldn't have, wouldn't be here without that program, but it was quite hard to juggle the two. I felt like one morning, you know, I was sitting there looking at sort of like statistical tables. And then in the afternoon, I had to talk about like metaphors and like, you know, like abstract things. And then at night, you, you're just like kind of trying to put all those things together. But I think the mixing of things in my mind has really helped my writing because I'm able to sort of just like, it's sort of being bilingual, right? Um, mm -hmm. It, it kind of just like opens up some neural networks um, in terms of fluency, in terms of just thinking um, and um, not taking yourself too seriously, I think, um, about, about, about certain things. Yeah, definitely a, a merging of the left and right brains. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, we've got, I'm going to kind of combine these next two questions into one. Um, what, did you take um, time off to write your first book? Um, do you have a long-term plan and are you working on another book currently? That's a great question. Um, I didn't take time off. If actually I like, um, I so, you know, the MFA program at BU was like one and a half years. And um, when the thesis was turned in, I realized that this was the last chance like Hajin and Sigrid Nunez were gonna read my thesis. Um, and so I pretty much just like pedal to the floor, kind of was working day in and day out trying to get this thesis to be good. So I don't embarrass myself, right? Um, and so I got it in, you know, and they didn't say anything for two weeks. And I thought, oh man, they hated it. Um, but, <laughs> 
But then Hajin sent me a really nice email and he's like, do you need an agent or do you need an editor? And can we kind of get this book out? Um, and that really started from there. And, you know, I, I think of anyone who's listening, who's thinking about this stuff, honestly, a lot of the times, no one is going to ask you to do the work. No one's going to ask you for the book. No one's going to ask you for your labor of love. But if you put in the labor of love, sometimes you will be rewarded for it, right? Um, so I think it's like the faith that I had in myself for like the four months to produce something. Um, and that was not what happened with this book. Oh my God. I turned in this book, February, 2020, with no pandemic in it. And then, you know, having to rewrite the second half of the book with the pandemic in it, um, because no person would believe that the pandemic wasn't happening. Um, so that this book took much longer. Um, so I don't really take time off to write things. I sort of have the schedule I write in the morning. I teach and sort of do my other jobs in the afternoon. Um, I answer a lot of needy students' emails. It's, you know, that's what teaching is. It's sort of this like, bottomless pit of need and you want to encourage them but you also want to help them um so so that, that's my other job and you know curriculum stuff and things like that so I try to get writing out of the way at the beginning because it's like the hardest part of my day and if I do it at night I'm just going to get angrier so I just do it in the morning get it over with even if it's not good um I'll delete it right um and what am I working on now I'm I'm not currently working on anything because I'm still reeling from like the PTSD of this book, to be honest. So um, mostly I'm just working on sort of shorter pieces, stories, essays. I'm sort of on the fence if I want to publish a collection of stories. I generally find collections are sort of like a great concept, but sometimes like reading through it, it's not maybe like the experience or the journey I want for a reader. And I think about that a lot, sort of like the reading experience, just like maybe like a chef thinks about you know, dining experience or something like that. So I, I do want to think about if I'm going to write this like third book, what kind of experience I'm looking for. Like, so The Stranger did a great deal for me in terms of, I really wanted to mimic that reading experience of reading that book in like five hours or something like that, the intensity of that ride. Um, and so that was like, Jonah's okay for me. Um, but I don't know what kind of experience I want later on. I'm kind of open to the idea of horror and sort of thinking about a way to kind of you know, write something with horror in it. Um, but we'll see, you know, I'm not as nervous as I was with John after chemistry. After chemistry, I was a little nervous that I wouldn't be able to write again. I was sort of paralyzed by the success of the book, the critical success of the book. Um, and with Jonah's okay, you know, I think I got over it. And now I'm just gonna, you know, write a third book when I write a third book um, and um, go from there, yeah. Yeah, I was I was taken by what you said about um, kind of the the reading experience because as yeah. I was I was I was reading this I um, probably about wasn't until halfway through that I noticed like oh this book doesn't have chapters this book it just I, like continues yeah. it has you know spaces there are, are, are page breaks but there are right. not um, there's no chapters to it and I was like oh that really works with this you know the day to day drudge of kind of you know making it through um, right. and and you know completing the tasks right completing the, the little yeah. sections of te text and every day is the same and it sort of kind of keeps that one experience so I had you know I think I'm actually surprised like every editor I had was like Waiki do you want to think about chapters do you want to think about chapters how about chapters what about sections that are called chapters uh, <laughs> and so, so I got a lot of questions about that I'm actually really glad that it hasn't really come up in reviews <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and so sometimes as a writer, you just have to stick to your guns a little bit. Um, there's certain, you know, you pick your battles, right? The chapter thing was like, I, I definitely don't want chapters, but other things you do have to kind of think about. Yeah, yeah I thought I thought it worked. I thought that um, especially those, you know, very short kind of punchy yeah. segments yeah. of, you know, three, four sentences that really um, kind of stand well, out. I had, and, I had a great um, undergrad teacher who was my first exposure to writing and um, her name was Amy, Amy Hempel. She's a fantastic short story writer um, and she just said, you know, don't underestimate white space. Like don't underestimate not saying anything as sort of so terrible. Like sometimes white space can be really nice for, as it is for art, visual art, right? It could be also for prose on the page and just how it looks and what that does for the reading experience of the, the reader has to kind of fill in the holes between the spaces. And if a reader's thinking, that's good. 
because then they're engaged, right? If you feed everything to the reader, then the reader feels insulted. You know, I never want to insult the reader. Um, but if the reader's confused, they're going to put down the book. So I really want to find that kind of middle ground of the reader engaged, thinking, figuring things out, but not lost. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it looks like we've got a hand raised in the chat. Rebecca, do you have a question? Yes, I just started to really get into horror. So I would be really interested Ooh, okay. in what <laughs> type of book that you would want to write. Um, and I've read a lot of translated um, horror. Right. So right. I, some of them have just kind of blown me out of my seat. <laughs> Right. I mean, I think that's great. Do you actually have recommendations for what I should read? Because I think sometimes if I read a good horror book, that might actually stir up some inspiration for me. Um, there is one, and I can't, it's, it's from uh, Scandinavia. Okay. Oh, and I wish I had wrote it down. Oh, it's um, okay. It's, it's, she's very famous. It's like Signer's Daughter or something okay. like that. The, the okay. author. Okay. Um, Oh, wow. I'm so upset that I, oh, wait, I might have it. No, I don't think I do. I mean, it really frightened me. Okay. So I, I'll look at in a Scandinavian singer's daughter. I'll look into, I mean, I, I, I don't know that much at all about the genre, I, but I, you know, I'm, I'm definitely open to learning and just try something different because it is really memorable. Yeah. I'm so sorry that I can't, I can't think of it right now. Uh, you caught me off guard. No, it's okay. <laughs> I don't, I don't mean to do that at all. <laughs> no, you didn't, no, you didn't mean to, but I, I never thought you were going to actually say horror. And I was like, oh my gosh, she's saying horror. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Of course. Um, we've only got about a minute left of our scheduled time. So I want to make sure I go ahead and I'm pasting right now the, um, catalog entry for Joan is Okay in the Dauphin County Library System catalog. Unfortunately, all of our copies, digital or uh, physical, are checked out right now, and we have some holds, oh, but yeah. please put yourself on the hold list. This this um, novel is, is truly a treat. I, I very much enjoyed reading it. I'm not just saying that because you're here. I, I really liked it. Um, I, I really liked Joan. I, I really appreciated the nuances of her, you know, experience and, and her personality and, and the things that she goes through. Um, and I, I don't know, I think it's important to yeah. read books by and about people who, um, you know, experience things differently than us and, you know, yeah. have, have different um, lives and goals and life paths. Um, I also want to quickly, this is also sending in the chat um, a link to Wiki's website if you want to check out that. Um, Waiki, is there anything that you would like to plug before we end our time today? Well, if you go to the website, on the left side, there's a tab that says dog, and then you get to see a cute picture of my dog. So that's <gasps> that's a that. really cool <laughs> second. You click on it, and then the left, the bottom thing under contact is dog. I put my dog on a stroller seat with a, another person's dog because they had twins, and we just like strollered our dogs through Central Park. It's a very cute picture. I can confirm I that you were just got it. <laughs> but, but anyway, that's my dog. Was my, I'm very proud of him. Um, <laughs> icing on the cake. Icing on, icing the, on cake. the cake. 